Microphone, okay. I, I kind of hate microphones, but I've been ordered to wear one. Uh, and so here's my CD, and so I'm going to give it to my graduate student contact, but that's for your student auction. And it is uh, full of songs about ecological processes and habitats and species like the short tailed shrew and uh, speckled trout, the native brook trout of the southern Appalachians. So, uh, can, can we dim the lights a little bit, or uh, do they have to stay light? Can everybody see okay? All right. Uh, so that's my title song, and you can be called a Renaissance man, or you can be diagnosed with multiple uh, personality disorder. You can take your pick at the end of the, at the, end of the seminar. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit just about climate change in the southeast. Uh, then two focuses, well, I guess three focuses of, or foci of my uh, research program, long-term population studies of stream fishes, uh, fitness-based habitat selection models, and uh, innovative, hopefully innovative uh, STEM pedagogical techniques. And I have a lot that I want to cover, so I'm going to really try to blow through this. Uh, I've been talking to people all day, so forgive me if I kind of get a little bit uh, hoarse. Uh, so this is a slide which explains why we need long-term studies. Uh, this is me in 1973, and you can compare it to me today, 19 uh, or 2020. Uh, so there have been significant changes, right? My weight is higher, my blood pressure is higher, cholesterol. Not all bad, right? I make a lot more money than I used to, and I own more property. Uh, what has declined over the years? My muscular flexibility, uh, my free time, my recreational drug use, and uh, the number of girlfriends. I've, I've been happily married for uh, almost 40 years as well. So. Uh, so, so that's a little slide explaining why we need long-term studies hopefully in a, in a more amusing format than you usually see from a seminar speaker. But what is going to happen with respect to global climate change, uh, which of course is the scientific reason, or one scientific reasons, that, uh, that we need long-term studies. So this is uh, a slide just of uh, projected increases in air temperature. I always point to Georgia, I realize unconsciously, but we're up here, aren't we? Uh, the red or the dark orange represents the change in the number of days in which the temperature is going to be over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can see that in both Georgia and South Carolina, there are areas where there are going to be 50 more days of very hot weather. All right, Climate change is, in fact, going to affect the southeast. Where I'm a stream fish person, along with some other people in the room. Uh, so 
how has climate change affected mean daily flow or flows? And, and Ball Creek is in the Southern Appalachians, which I'll show you some slides of in a minute. Uh, this graph just shows the 30 year period roughly that I've been working up there. Uh, the maroon bars are the years in which our study, we, we collected data. Uh, what you can see is that some of the highest flow years during this period occurred uh, or were our study years as well as some of the lowest uh, flow years. So it's a, it's a highly variable environment and the variability is, is going to increase. This, this whole graph is uh, almost 80 years of data. We actually have rainfall data and the exact same pattern uh, obtains when you use the 150 plus year uh, set of, of rainfall data that, that within a short period of time you can get extremely high flows and extremely low flows. Okay, so this is a map of uh, the Coweta Creek drainage, a fifth order stream uh, in western North Carolina on the, the uh, Coweta Hydrologic Station. Uh, and the thing that's nice about that is that although the, the uh, streams are gauged and there are some additional physical chemical data that are taken, uh, I'm, I'm not really going to get into data much from individual sites, uh, but we sampled three 30 meter sites between 84 and 95 quantitative estimates of, of abundance uh, for, for the fishes. And then from 91 to 2004, we increased our sample size to 100 meter sites. And I will talk about those, the general patterns in those data. So we started in, in spring of 84 when I was just in short pants and, uh, and, and concluded our sampling in 2004. Not actually that we wanted to, but we, we lost some funding. So we sampled quantitatively in, in spring and fall. Uh, standard put up block nets, did three pass electrofishing, which gives us a pretty precise abundance estimate as well as a, a standard error around that mean. And for the fishes that we're looking at, this period represents, well, each, each one of these 10 year periods represents four to five times the mean generation time. Mean generation time for the species I'm gonna talk about is, is between two and four years. We also measured habitat availability. Uh, we had long-term flow data from the station. So uh, what I wanted to do with these data is look at the relative impacts or the relative importance of density dependent versus density independent forces on both growth uh, and by that I mean individual growth and uh, uh, the per capita rate of change of the population. So looked at it from a population perspective as well as a, a, a growth perspective. And so these are just little cartoons depicting the, the kind of extremes of uh, a population that might be totally controlled by density independent factors. Uh, in this case, since we're talking about streams of flood uh, and, and, you know, here's the standard graph that you've all seen about uh, how population abundance changes uh, in a population regulated through density dependent processes. Uh, K is up here, K divided by two. Who can tell me what K divided by two uh, represents? I'm just trying to engage the audience. That's one of the, come on. Who, Where's the guy that teaches fisheries management? <laughs> All right, K, K divided by two is? Well, it is that too, but it's also the point at, at which maximum exploitation can take place. Uh, the point at which the population has the maximum ability to respond to replace those individuals that you had harvested. Okay, this is what uh, the Coweta drainage looks like. Uh, it's a, a horrid place to work, but you know, somebody has to do it. So uh, I, I ponied up to the bar. Long-term environmental data during this period, we had two droughts, uh, two, two droughts that were multi-year droughts. So uh, 84 
th no, this is the sampling period. Uh, eight, the first with the 30 meter sites, 84 to 95, with 100 meter sites, 91 to 2004. In both cases, we had three to four year uh, multi year droughts. And so we have data from non drought periods, data from drought periods, and, and this is what happens uh, drought versus non drought. So during a drought, and, and this is these are the data from this time period. Okay. Uh, in both cases, we have a significant decrease in high flow events, significant decrease, in this case, in depth, velocity, and erosional substrata. So uh, erosional substrata are just large pieces of substratum like cobble and bedrock, et cetera. Uh, depositional substrata are silt, sand, et cetera. Uh, here we didn't see a change in depth, but we did see a change in velocity, uh, increases in silt and sand in both. The point here is that the physical responses within the drainage were pretty similar despite, uh, you know, uh, essentially, let's see, this was 84 through 88, and this was 99 through 2002, uh, despite being approximately 10 years apart. Uh, these are the four dominant species, the mottled sculpin, the rainbow trout, rosy side dace, and the long-nosed dace. Uh, we had sufficient data for these four species to look at the dominant factors affecting their, uh, their populations. How did we do this? Uh, you know, I'm an old guy from the back in the last century where we didn't have model selection analysis. We did have regression, however. So, Essentially, we are using a model selection approach in which we build a variety of regression models, uh, and then we use those models, we evaluate those models uh, using a case information criterion, which tells us how much information is lost by using the regression model. Okay, so, uh, so a low Akaike uh, value a low delta AIC is good. It means that most information was retained by the model. A high uh, delta AIC is, uh, is bad because it means high amounts of, uh, of information were lost. And we, there are two ways of, of using a chi case information criterion. One is the delta AIC that I, I just talked about. The one that I like because I think it is uh, uh, more intuitively understandable is the Akake's information criterion. No, that's AIC. It's the Akake. I don't know. Actually, I've forgotten what it what it is. It's W sub I. Uh, maybe it's the Akake coefficient or something. What is it? Model weight. Okay, model weight. So so the that W value ranges from one to zero. Uh, one means that all the information was kept, and zero means that it was all lost. So I just find that a little, a little more intuitive. All right, so these are, I've spent more time than I wanted uh, talking about that, and you all can read very well. So those are the types of models we tested. Here are the results for rosy side days. Uh, these actually are data for sites in both time periods. The only thing, and, and the lights have washed out the color a little bit, but uh, the model that uh, has the, I, I like to say has the highest explanatory power rather than displayed the lowest information loss, but the, but the model uh, that, that had the greatest explanatory power is either density dependence or delayed density dependence. This is positive density independence. Uh, negative density dependence, delayed. So all, all these, we examined all of these things. Uh, there is some evidence of, uh, of density independence playing a role in this, in this population. Uh, here we have the per capita rate of increase, the population variable we're testing. Here we have mean individual growth. Um, all right, so it's pretty much a density dependent ball game. One thing I would note is that this is for the population as a whole, we've actually done this, uh, broken down between adults and juveniles if there is an identifiable 
juvenile class and of course young of the year and I and I tell you that because this is for the whole population so some of the things that affected young of the year do not show up as well as they do in the young of the year analyses themselves so when you're working with the whole population you you really need to look at components too if you want to get at what's driving uh, different segments of the population itself so this is recruitment so these are young that were born uh, in the summer of 1986 the open histograms are the drought years the closed histograms are non-drought years and you can see quite easily that for this species in general the only time that recruitment occurs is is during drought years and those are years in which flows are lower uh, depth may or may not be uh, shallower uh, and so if we want to manage for this species which I don't even know if is Conostomus in South Carolina it is okay probably just in the mountain little Upper northwest tip uh, if we want to manage for this species we need to make sure that uh, not that conditions are some kind of happy mean but that there are low water years so that we can get good recruitment to maintain the population. So the punchline here is that at least with stream fishes in general, uh, variability of flow is an important driver for many demographic and community characteristics. So our, our, from a management perspective, at least when I went to school back in the, you know, back in the last century, there was you know there was an idea that you wanted to find some happy mean you did a variance was bad right and you wanted to find whatever the happy mean was for that species or for that community and now we know that that for some fish assemblages in particular that variation if we want to manage for high biodiversity we need to manage and preserve natural variability and flow okay another little example here from uh, a dominant species on the complexity of, of these recruitment relationships. So here we have mean daily flow again. Uh, here we have young of the year density. So the individuals produced in a given year. And what you can see here so is, is this parabolic relationship that uh, once flow kind of hits normal flows or progresses to high flows, there is a negative relationship between flow and, and recruitment of young of the year. But in drought years, and this is actually two points, and things here obviously were so bad, we actually didn't get any recruitment. Uh, but in drought years, there's a positive relationship between recruitment of young of the year sculpin and, uh, and flow. So these relationships are complex and, and again, demonstrate the need to examine dynamics of populations under variable conditions. Uh, okay, so back to my four, my four species, and now just a summary slide. Uh, and I'm just giving you the fall data, and you can ask me why if you want later. Uh, so of those four species, there were 16 possible cases where uh, either density dependence or density independent uh, Factors could be dominant, but in all 16 cases, it was density dependent, again, for the population. Uh, there were four cases out of 16 were density independent. Forces were the dominant factor. Uh, growth, and, and we can talk about, this actually is uh, not a robust test. And the reason it's not a robust test is that you are regressing uh, NT versus NT plus one versus NT. So all, if you just look at, at the per capita rate of increase or abundance, all you can conclude is that the results may be consistent. Um, but growth data, if you can show that there is a negative relationship between mean individual growth and, uh, uh, and population size or some other measure uh, of potential density dependence, that is a true test, and nobody really argues with that. Um, so we got eight of 16 cases where density dependence was uh, in an interpretable model or was the best interpretable model 
uh, for these four various population segments of these four species, and only one in which density independent uh, factors were the driving, driving phenomena. Okay, so why is that important, and how is it linked to global climate change? Uh, so this is just another little cartoon depicting the dynamics of, of this fish assemblage. Uh, so if we have high flows, the general pattern is that there's reduced young of the year abundance. There will be decreased density dependence, uh, decreased intraspecific competition. If flows are low, we have increased young of the year abundance, increased density dependence, Climate change, everyone agrees, is going to lead to an increased intensity or, and frequency of flows. Well, global climate change, if it leads to increased and extreme flows, it's going to reduce the importance of density dependence and increase density independent effects. And uh, only populations that display density dependence are going to be capable of responding to environmental perturbations like climate change. So if you're looking at populations in which density dependent factors are the most important, those are the species that are really in danger of, of being uh, whacked by, by global climate change. All right, so that's why we look at this stuff. Uh, I've been interested in the phenomena of density dependence for uh, a while, we have a paper that's just come out online uh, in which we looked at salmonids. So for you wildlifers, uh, this is just a family of trout, salmon, grayling, and whitefish. Uh, most, in, in terms of commercial importance, it probably is the family with the greatest important commercial value uh, of any freshwater fish family. So. Uh, these are species that need cold water. Again, uh, species that the predictions are they're going to be strongly affected by, by climate change. Um, so we reviewed 199 published data sets for 21 species, and we didn't do any kind of sophisticated uh, meta-analysis. So if somebody said we found density dependence in growth, we said, okay, density, you know, check one in the growth column. So what we found in that data set, and there were no, no differences in the frequency of density dependence among species, uh, what we found was that 71% uh, of the data sets over these 21 species showed evidence of density dependence in growth. Well, that's good news, isn't it? 23% uh, showed evidence of density dependent mortality. Uh, recruitment and fecundity, just tiny figures. Uh, and the reason is not because everybody examined those factors, but because there are so few, it, they're logistically difficult things to look at, and very few studies uh, examined them. And, and, and so that is the point that I want you to get from this, is not that this is any relative comparison, uh, but that most species of salmonids show density dependence and growth one of the reasons for that is that that is the most studied topic, okay? All right, so uh, now I'm gonna move into the second uh, topic that I wanna, I wanna talk about, uh, and that is the development of fitness-based habitat selection models for drift feeding fishes. So drift feeding fishes are, uh, are like trout or water column minnows, they sit in the water column, they hold a position and they feed on drifting insects that, that the current brings to them. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in mechanisms, all right? Uh, most of the habitat selection models that are used in fisheries, and maybe I'd, I'll bet in wildlife as well, are correlative models. So, you know, uh, an investigator goes out there, measures, uh, abundance of uh, an organism measures the habitat characteristics, then makes the sometimes catastrophic assumption, because we know of source sink dynamics and, and all that, makes, makes the assumption that uh, high quality habitat is where abundance is highest. All right, so that's a correlative model, right? They, they, there's no further step taken, for example, to uh, 
to determine whether for a wren it is uh, the abundance of, of, of uh, brush below one meter, uh, you know, there's no study where they go out and manipulate all that to actually show that, that that's the, the causative factor uh, in terms of a wren selecting this spot. So what I wanted to do for drift feeding fishes was develop a, a, a mechanistic model, but one that was fitness based, okay? So uh, this is just a simple uh, cartoon depicting a hypothetical energetic cost curve. So remember, these, these individuals are swimming in the current, right? So supposedly there's a, a cost to that. Uh, they're feeding on things that are drifting down. And there, in general, is a positive correlation uh, between velocity and the amount of prey that are drifting down. And, and so we would say the optimal, if we're talking about fitness, we would say the optimal velocity would be the one at which uh, we have the maxima uh, distance between these two curves because that's the place at which the individual would have the maximum amount of energy to fight disease, to avoid predators, to pump out reproductive products, et cetera. All right, so it turns out, uh, it, it turns out although this is a nice little cartoon and, and quite intuitive, uh, so here's velocity here and here's energetic cost uh, or benefit, it turns out that the cost, at least for these, these fishes in the water column, it's really difficult to parameterize in any way that, that you could add it to a more complicated model uh, and, have, and have good confidence that it's an accurate estimate. And to give you an example, so, uh, so I had a PhD student, uh, again, way back in the dark ages, uh, do swimming respirometry on these four species. We published a paper in 1990 in Physiological Zoology to my knowledge, that was the first paper that actually had standard deviation lines on a curve between velocity and, and oxygen consumption, energetic cost. So, uh, and, and that was because it was just so variable that nobody would ever publish a, a variance estimate around, around their lines. So, uh, so, okay, that was a, it's a, a problem, right? I mean, parameterizing costs is a problem because of, of these things. Uh, so we thought, well, how, how could we create a model in which uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about this? And so the, the first time we tried to modify this model uh, was in a 1993 paper with another PhD student uh, in which we actually parameterized the whole thing. Uh, but what we compared it to was a cost curve, not a cost curve, a benefit curve of prey, I think that's my next slide. Okay, my next slide. Well, one other little factoid is uh, a convenient factor about, about thinking why we might not have to worry about this is that when you look at field measurements of drift feeding fishes, the velocities they, they occupy, they're almost all, excuse me, they're almost all down on this portion of the curve where velocity is relatively uh, unimportant compared to if they were over here, right? Okay, so we thought, how can we, what can we do to forget about this cost stuff? And we thought, well, if we do experiments, I mean, we're doing the experiments anyway with, to parameterize the benefit side of the curve, where we look at the percent of prey captured versus velocity, uh, one thing we might take as an optimal velocity would be the third derivative of this curve, which is just the point of maximum deceleration. Uh, and that actually provided better estimates than the complete model. So we thought, okay, we're on, we're on to something. So we developed this, this model, which gives us a, uh, uh, an estimate of the velocity at which the fish maximizes <laughs> its energy intake based on this experimental curve. And we have to make assumptions and all sorts of things. And I'm not really gonna go into the model. It's been published lots of times. And uh, Okay, so this is what one of those, uh, 
one of those experiments looks like. This is for grayling uh, at 20 centimeters per second. And, and so you can see the grayling holds at the back of the tank. The prey comes in from here. The current is going this direction. The gray leg just grabbed uh, prey, and, and it'll grab another one, just so you get an idea of how these experiments are done. Uh, we've done them with eight species so far. And this is what a, a, the curve for gray leg looks like. These are ends. Uh, this is the percent prey capture success standardized from zero to one. Uh, and, and they all, everyone we've done has kind of an asymptotic phase here, then a negative exponential decline, and sometimes an asymptotic uh, phase out at high velocities. Uh, this is treatment velocity. Grayling are super fish. I mean, they can capture some prey even at 70 centimeters per second, which is a phenomenally high velocity for a fish to hold position in. All right, so those are the kind of data we, we then drive our model prediction. Uh, this is from an early paper using this technique. Again, uh, fishes, drift feeding fishes at Coweta. Uh, the predicted holding velocity by the model is an asterisk. Uh, this is the mean holding velocity and a 95% confidence interval. And what you can see is for these four species, the model did, in fact, yield successful predictions uh, of where they should be in the stream if they are optimizing their net energy gain. Uh, this is all the possible velocities they could, they could occupy, and this is mean velocity. Uh, all of these are significant than mean velocity, so these fish aren't behaving at random. So again, uh, a slide that just has pooled results. Uh, and so for rosy side days, here we have the number of successful predictions versus the number of cases. Uh, and this was done, I mean, for some species, we had uh, multiple years, multiple sites, multiple seasons. So that's just what that shows. So. Uh, Five out of six cases for rosy side days, they behaved in an optimal manner. War paint shiner, three out of three. Yellowfin, two out of three. And Tennessee shiner, one out of two. Um, these are the smallest ends. So, you know, maybe that was at least partially a sample size phenomena. So, uh, as a good scientist, uh, I didn't rest on my laurels in, in uh, the Southern Appalachians, but I managed to get a grant to work with Alaskan fishes. Uh, Arctic grayling that I showed you the video of, of course, is a boreal, boreal fish, very abundant in Alaska. Uh, we worked both in very large uh, spring-fed rivers and also in somewhat tannic small streams. Uh, okay, so, so what did, and we, we worked with three species, Arctic grayling in two different streams, Chinook uh, in, in one river, which I didn't show you, and interior Dolly Varden. Uh, what did we find? We found that for the Richardson Clearwater, our prediction for grayling was successful. For Panguini Creek, that little creek, uh, didn't work. And for Chinook, it also didn't work. Uh, for Dolly Varden and Panguini Creek, it, it pretty much worked. Uh, I mean, the prediction was within less than one centimeter per second of the lower confidence interval bound uh, and, and well within measurement error. So uh, kind of mixed results. Uh, Chinook, it was juvenile Chinook we were looking. I mean, they're really young of the year. I don't know why they call them juveniles. Uh, and, and they are strongly influenced, my guess would be, by predators. They're always associated with log jams and, and shelter. And, and of course, you know, kingfishers are flying over and mink are, I mean, we actually had a mink climb into our, our boat. Uh, so I think predation there, here in Panguini, uh, in, in the Richardson Clearwater, 
there are, the grayling are the biggest uh, species and there isn't really anything that's a competitor. But in Panguini Creek, there are also Dolly Varden uh, and, and they're very aggressive fish uh, and, and we think that, that that probably has something to do with the failure in, in Panguini of the model. So we're continuing to, to do our tests. You know, of course, if we can get, uh, get more funding. Uh, we also looked at the effect of dominance on prey capture success. One of the first times the actual cost of dominance has been quantified and we found that dominant fish have significantly greater access to prey and that subordinate fish sometimes really take it in the shorts. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to do, uh, I'll be writing an NSF proposal, is uh, trying to scale this up. So uh, to couple the model with a hydraulic model of a system that would estimate the, the number of optimal holding positions, uh, taking our prediction, getting our optimal velocity, using the hydraulic model for, to tell us how many are in the reach that we're interested in looking at, and then go, going out and measuring the abundance of the fishes in that reef. And so far, NSF hasn't really bitten on that, uh, but Hope Springs Eternal. Okay, so what are the kind of biology conclusions here? Uh, as, as climate change, the effects of climate change increase, uh, density dependence may decrease, and that may result in destabilization of populations and assemblages. And of course, you all know that the southeast is the center of biodiversity, for, certainly for the aquatic fauna, uh, and, and pretty high on the list for terrestrial biota as well. But that these responses are, are probably going to be complex, uh, involving responses both to means and, and variances and the pattern of, of variation. Okay, you can read the rest. Or you could have had I not changed it so quickly. Uh, so I'm going to talk about... Uh, some of, the, some of the innovative STEM ped pedagogical uh, uh, techniques that, that uh, I've developed for teaching. Uh, my position is, is most, it's always been mostly a research position, uh, but about 10 years ago, I decided that I wanted to, you know, rather than just teaching ecology students and fish and wildlife students, um, I thought I could have a greater impact by teaching a lower division course uh, in which I taught them ecology, but they didn't realize that was what they were learning because it would be so much fun. So I developed a course in Georgia, natural history. Uh, I teach, I mean, I could call it the birds and the bees for art students. Uh, we cover all the animal taxa. We cover trees. Uh, they learn about, uh, I would say, 250 to 300 species by sight. Uh, and uh, they learn upper division ecology, although, as I said, they, I mean, they learn the difference between intra and interspecific competition and, uh, you know, sp how spatial patchiness affects uh, po population size and things like that. So, uh, most, so the class is an odd hybrid uh, because it is 70% non-science students, non-STEM students and 30% fifth year biology students who had to come back for one course and they decided they wanted to take a fun course. Um, but when you're teaching a mix like that, especially when you're teaching a mix of non-science majors who may not really have an intuitive uh, grasp or an intuitive interest in this subject, and I should mention this, this class meets two general education requirements. So, the students that are taking it, they're, I mean, they may be interested in the subject, but they also uh, get their general education science requirement and the school's, the, the university's environmental literacy requirement out of the way by taking this class. Um, so there I am playing my ukulele. Uh, I, like the last time I played an instrument was in seventh grade and it was the clarinet, and uh, I got awarded a fellowship to spend a number of months in New Zealand. 
and and I ha I have, I've always liked to sing, but I have these. I'm not morphologically adapted for string string instruments. So, but I thought ukulele that small. I won't know anybody in New Zealand, so that would be the time to to learn. So I learned, and I started thinking, how can I incorporate song into my teaching? And the end result was this. Uh, 12 song CD and a, a, a YouTube channel uh, and, and actually a little paper uh, on using music videos to, to teach science. And I'm going to show you uh, excerpts. So this is the mnemonic for uh, the Linnaean hierarchy, right? So when I lecture on that topic, I just play this video. So that's how they're used. And I'm going to kind of fast forward here because we're So this is on the models of speciation. We're, I want to turn up the volume a little bit, but I'm not sure how to do it here. Oh, I don't see it there either. You want to come up and turn up the volume a little bit? So this is on interspecific competition. Oh, oh OK. Let's have a little volume thing right there. Oh, wait, over here? Yeah, let's see. Oh, there yeah, you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. wait, it, it didn't do anything, did it? It kind of did. They actually turned down the volume. <laughs> All right. Okay. That was louder, right? All right, yeah. So, okay. okay, so just Where were we? click there. Here? Let's see. Oh, that was pretty That's close. it. Okay. Natural selection makes evolution go. Charlie Darwin knew it, Alfie Wallace ever so. Three types of selection that we can allow. They stabilize, they disrupt, or direct to trace somehow. So this is, this is on. <laughs> All right, let's, let's see if we can turn it down a little bit. <laughs> so the songs are on species characteristics, uh, habitats, and uh, uh, an ecological concept. Is that too loud? This one doesn't have the words. education professor and he said well we're into active learning and how can you get the students to do this uh, and so I had to put on my thinking cap and to take a step backwards um, and, and go over the background for things like active learning uh, this is what's called Bloom's taxonomy or Bloom's pyramid uh, and it represents a hierarchy of, of how students learn. So students learn the most by creating. They learn the least 
by remembering. And of course, our traditional models of teaching in, in, in science are down here, right? They're what we're doing right now, uh, although I don't see enough people taking notes. Uh, there, I stand up here and lecture, and you write down what I say, and then you ask me 30 times whether it's going to be on the exam or not. All right, so, uh, so we're down here traditionally, so how can we get up here? I would say that, that we're not all bad, that sometimes we have class research projects that uh, involve these sorts of processes, and sometimes even, even labs. Uh, when I looked at the literature, trying to figure out how I could go from me doing this song to the students doing this song, I found that there's, there's almost nothing published in the literature on, on life science classes. So there's a lot for high school students for at, at a university level. There are things for high school students. Uh, there are things, you know, a paper or two on physics, but almost nothing on, on biology. So... Uh, so I put on my thinking cap and I thought, we'll, we'll do karaoke videos. So uh, depending on the class, it's either a group or an individual project. Uh, it can be the same uh, topics that, that I use. The students can find video and music, but they must write, sing, or speak the lyrics. I don't make everybody sing. And, and we published a nice summary paper based on the data I'm about to show you in uh, the Journal of College Science teaching a, a little over a year ago. Uh, how did we evaluate students' attitudes? Uh, it was by giving out questionnaires, Likert scale questionnaires. Uh, all you have to focus on here is the color of the number. If, if the number is in red, it means that over 80% of the positive of the responses were positive. If it's uh, in blue, it means 60 to, to 79. Uh, in the science ed literature, if you get a response uh, that's maybe 30% positive, those, you know, those are good data. So uh, the students really like this. These are the classes. This is a graduate class. These are first year seminar classes. Uh, and these are my natural history classes. So the response was very positive. Uh, we didn't just do questionnaires. We did what are called triangulation interviews, and I, I can talk about those afterwards. Uh, but the main thing is, you know, going back to Bloom's, Bloom's pyramid, we want things that are new, creative, enjoyable, represent deeper learning. Uh, and there were some negatives that came out that uh, in the classes where it was a group project, in my natural history class, uh, there were some students that complained that, that there wasn't an equal distribution of labor, uh, and everybody pretty much had trouble scheduling group meetings. So uh, now let's look at what some of these videos look like. Look at his hump. It is so big. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, so I'm, I'm kind of bumping up my time limit here. Uh, anyway, this is a really fun exercise, uh, and I would urge you all to try it. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is another project that I do in my class that's, uh, that's an active learning video behavioral research assignments. And so students can choose a video, in this case, uh, from a group of videos that I provide. Uh, they can observe and deduce. I actually give them a rubric, uh, what the animals are doing. We have uh, uh, some work sessions in class, kind of a flipped classroom idea. Uh, and at the end, they turn in an 8 to 10 page double spaced paper in uh, IMRAD format. And so here are two, oh, that's interesting. This is, the little thing isn't coming up. Huh. All right, all right. Oh, and we've pulled out my, we've pulled out my memory stick, so. You know what? I'll, let me get to the end, and then we can we can uh, go back to those videos. Um, okay. So, two video. These are. It's just an example of two of the videos. Uh, there's a little Dolly Varden uh, char back there. Uh, it's a 10-minute video of that individual interacting with other Dolly Vardens. So the idea of that is either uh, behavioral repertoires or uh, intraspecific aggression is the bigger one, always the winner, who leaves the video, et cetera. Um, this is just a block of suet in wintertime uh, in the front of my house. And uh, so the questions for, for this are things like, is there always a bird there, or do they arrive in, in uh, some periodic manner? Is there always one species that arrives first? Uh, is there any indication that other species are keying in on that one species? Are there species that co-occur uh, or species that won't tolerate each other? Anyway, so you can, I mean, you can get video to test whatever you want. There's a lot of possibilities here. So this is the same kind of format, right? The red uh, is over 80% and the blue is uh, 60 to 79. Uh, a little less positive a response, uh, but they still, I mean, this is a lot of work, right? These are like history, ma well, history majors write a lot, but an eight to 10 page paper for a lot of these students is a lot of work. So. Uh, I, I'm not disappointed that there's not as strong a positive uh, response. So, uh, well, I went over my time. I apologize. Um, I've already told you about this stuff and tell you one more time what we'll convince you, uh, if you're not already convinced. Uh, hopefully I've showed you that these sort of multimodal, like using, making your own music videos, uh, can improve student attitudes towards class and studying. <coughs> that, that developing a technique where students are, are making their own karaoke videos, that very positive responses. Uh, and in general, uh, pretty strong positive responses to the active learning exercise, um, you know, varied among classes. It really, it, the, the only really different responses were, and I guess I should go back, so, First year seminar, natural history, natural history. Um, these really, uh, these responses are the only ones that are lower and different from the rest of these. And, and this was the first time I had done it. I really didn't have it. Uh, I didn't have the rubric as fine tuned as, uh, uh, as I should have. And the fine tuning was based on student responses. Um, but then once, once I was sensitive to those issues the students were having, we got, strong positive responses. So that's it, and I thank you for being such a great audience, and I'll be glad to take whatever questions you have. At least I think I will.
We have just uh, three or four minutes, so if anybody has any uh, brief questions, feel free. So what do those curves look like for my draft lot? I mean, I mean, really, what? That's, that's yeah. Like, you know, well, I, I think, uh, if you, so are you really a fly fisherman? All right, well, I think you have a pretty good intuitive sense of where to throw that dry fly. Like in current seams, uh, the heads of pools where they're going to be waiting for something to come down. The, there's always a fish at the tail of the pool. So, um, But expanding it spatially, I mean, when we do this, we do the experiments, then we get in the stream with our mask and snorkel and velocity meter and other things. And so we're just making measurements on, on individuals, and, and then we're comparing those mean, that mean holding velocity to the prediction of the model. So there's no spatial component in the model right now. So that is something that I would, that I would like, to, like to add. The one bit of advice I would give you is that uh, trout fishermen, trout in the southeast, sometimes do hang by obstructions like logs. They do that after they're scared, but a lot of people just will fish by an obstruction and leave the open water alone. And there are plenty of trout in that open water. So I hope that helps. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, do you have a fish that you study named Dolly Martin? Yeah. As the oh, that's interesting. That could be a head, huh? They just let that pun go right by. Yeah. I, well, I didn't even think about it until you you just... And I just finished watching the PBS country music thing, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I assume your idea is offered up in the spirit of sharing. Uh, and and I, I may uh, do something with that, so... Careful if you write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a quick question. Sure. You know, uh, with the, the the karaoke assignment, you know, the definitely non-traditional stuff. You ever get students who are just like, man, I'm too cool for this. I don't. I'm just not going to engage. Uh, does that? So this is like a trick question, right? Because didn't I already tell you that the last graduate class I did this in, they pissed and moaned the whole time? Uh, no. Okay, that was somebody else. Uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, I just finished teaching a class that I teach every other year on how to be a scientist. Uh, it was all master's students and one PhD student, and uh, there was a significant number, maybe five, that were totally pissed off about doing this. And uh, so my results with my other graduate classes were very positive. I, I don't know whether it was just this group of students uh, or, you know, that I got lucky the first couple times or that there's a temporal change in student attitudes towards these type of exercises. Uh, but the logic I employed in why they were doing this was that it's the 21st century. You need to know how to use video. It'd be good if you knew how to use, you know, video that had sound as well. Uh, because whatever job you're in, this is an effective medium for, for uh, communication of, of information, right? I mean, that's, this microphone is that y'all are taping my talk. And so these are skills that you all should have as, as graduate students. Um, I, you know, I don't know why they were, it's a mystery to me obviously now that they're, they were pissed off about it, but and I won't badmouth graduate students anymore in, in this talk. <laughs> so. I mean, how? Raise your hand if you're a master's student. Okay, so how would you regard this? Would you be pissed off at having to do this? I, I will say that it's was it's not graded on technique or anything like that. It was just totally graded pretty much on, on content, on accuracy of content. So uh, uh, I guess let's do it from the positive side. How, how many of you wouldn't be pissed off at doing it, would view it as something that would be enjoyable? All right, well, I'll teach it here next time. <laughs> And, and I, I said, so some people are 
So I, I do always give students the option, the last day of class, uh, these are all anonymized. So the last day of class, we watch all the videos in the class. And so I do give the students uh, the option of not showing their video. And some students do get really freaked out by this, like by having to sing. Of course, they don't have to sing. I, I mean, they can rap or they can just speak it. But uh, there was one student out of this five that was just, uh, the, was totally freaked out by having to do it. It was not a, you're wasting my time like some of the other students. So, well, maybe you can, maybe this little display will uh, induce some of your faculty to try and include this in their, in their classes. Maybe so. Uh, all right, if nobody has any other questions, let's thank Jerry again. Thanks again. It's always an honor to be asked to give a talk.